Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Good evening. Top story today, Irish biotech startup H plus Nano. A new breakthrough in implantation technology might just pave the way. Computers in the brain? Sound like science fiction? Well, not according to H plus Nano. The company has just released a medical implant that they say is more than just a merging of man and machine. H plus. The world is in you. You're always online. You're always connected. With me right now is uh, John Cabrera, um, the uh, writer and executive producer of the exciting new sci-fi web series. Yes, believe it or not, I did say web series, uh, H+. Plus. How are you doing, John? I'm well. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. I've, I've actually just been watching this web series of yours, um, and you know, I, I just got to say, it's, it's, it's really, really, really good. It's kind of scary in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, how, how how did the actual idea come about uh, for, for it? Uh, we have been writing this for well, it's been in Cosmo in my life for um, six years. We conceived the idea back in 2006, and to give you a little perspective, that was. Uh, before the iPhone came out. So uh, uh, in, in regards to technology, the world was in a, a, a different place, at least, you know, in, in terms of our, our smart devices. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, we were, the, the idea sort of came from this, uh, you know, this, this sense that we were getting uh, about our, our, our connectivity and our vulnerability when not connected. Uh, I was actually uh, driving through a parking lot back by sometime in 2006, and I remember my, my radio started going off um, in the car, and, and, uh, and it was a really good song, and I stopped the car, and of course, you know, backed up traffic behind me, and, and uh, finally went into the lot, lost the song, and I think it was in that moment that it sort of, it sort of struck me how vulnerable we, we really are when we uh, when we are disconnected and that kernel of an idea somehow it sort of morphed into this this idea of a world implanted with computers because really um, you know whether they're inside our bodies or inside our pockets this technology really has sort of embedded itself into our humanity um, we, we treat our phones like they are a part of us when we lose them we we get terrified you know for for uh for a few moments and and if we really did lose them you know we're, we're going you know weeks of of repair trying to um get everything back together so um we really wanted to explore this relationship between our tools um and, and uh and and really what uh you know how much of our tools define us as a species. Mm-hmm. Uh, where where did the uh, the idea for the name come from? H plus. Um... Well, H plus H plus is is the uh, sort of uh, internationally recognized symbol for transhumanism, which is ah, uh, right. this cultural, intellectual uh, movement ideology um, that uh, supports um, the upgrading of the human body and the human. Uh, experience um, through technology, um, you know, uh, essentially human plus, right? Hum- humanity only better. So, so this is this is an actual organization. Well, not necessarily an organization. It's it's. Uh, I mean, there are organizations that that use the uh, that use the symbol. It's more of a of an ideology. Um, mm-hmm. It's just the abbreviation for the word transhumanism, which is more of an ideology. Um, you know, for this. Upgrading of, of the human body through advanced, te- you know, advanced uh, technology techniques, from uh, genetic engineering to uh, implants like what we're talking about here. But it also sort of spreads out into other areas, um, you know, that uh, that deal with the idea of the singularity and machine intelligence and the hive mind, collective consciousness, all of that good stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I watched the uh, first four, maybe five episodes so far. I, I just saw that I've been cramming them in wherever I can over the last couple of days. Um, yeah, that's sort of the that's that's the the appeal, right? Like popcorn, you know, you can just munch a few when you when you have a chance. Yeah, that that's kind of the appeal. But you know, ring with me, I I prefer you know when I can. Um, but I'm so busy that I can't right now. But when 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 it comes to web series, really, I just prefer to watch them all in one go. If all parts are available, I would just sort of try and sit down for a whole hour, and and watch the whole lot. Um, 
But, you know, the, the one thing that struck me is, uh, you know, a virus hits and, and everyone dies. And, uh, you know, I was kind of like thinking, well, that's kind of like very, sort of like, uh, very, very, very real. And, very, and it was a very real fear about what could happen now. But you've got people walking around with pacemakers that are run by microchips and God only knows what sort of thing. So, you know, this, this stuff could actually happen. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the the the, uh, the world that we paint in the in the series is definitely one that we, you know, that we we sort of built through a lot of research, and uh, much of the technology that we talk about in the series is either, you know, in its it's either technology that actually exists in a very rudimentary form, or another technology exists in a at least a rudimentary form that um, we imagine could one day evolve into this, and. And because of that, I think that, you know, all, all of the real fears that we have with technology today um, can easily be transferred over to this, uh, you know, to, to the technology that we, we talked about here in, in the series. Um, and I don't necessarily think that that makes this a doomsday scenario. Um, you know, I, I, I actually don't really believe in doomsday scenarios. I think that doomsday is always uh, is always sort of um, subjective, right? Like, you... you uh, you like you only feel like you're in an apo- or you only think it's an apocalypse while you're in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know the hum- human human story has included several apocalypses by by our definition, um, and we always seem to get past them. Right, the bubonic plague killed off half of Europe. You know, as much as half of half of Europe. Um, we got past it. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that in a series like this, if anything, these sorts of dangers, what's so, I think the, the more interesting question here is why we as a species always seem willing to take these great risks, you know, great risks that come with nuclear energy, with genetically modifying our food. We understand that they come with a really, uh, a great, um, great risk and, and could, could cause catastrophic, um, you know, uh, happenings that, that could, Really uh, take down the species as, as we know it, and yet we we do them anyway. And and I think that we were just really fascinated with that. I don't think that we wanted to paint the technology as good or bad. I mean, I think ultimately technology is neither good nor bad. It's the use of the technology really. Um, and uh, and you could say that a lot of the the, the, um, the problems that we've seen because of uh, of the technology uh, in the past, and certainly there have been plenty of. Uh, I mean, I'd say many more amazing good things that we've seen from technology, but a lot of the, 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 uh, the you know, the, the bad that we've seen from technology has really come from mistakes that we've made. I think that it's probably, to a degree, the responsibility of science fiction writers, and I think that's why we see so many cautionary tales in sci-fi. I think that there's, to a degree, there is some responsibility from writers to talk about some of these issues, because as you said, it, it's true, uh, a lot of this type of danger exists in our technology today. So it's not a great leap to imagine that if this were to, uh, you know, this type of technology that we have in the series were to to, um, to really come about, that, that it wouldn't have similar uh, dangers associated mm-hmm. with it. Um, how did you actually wind up working with Brian Singer on this? Um, that, that, that's, that right there is a pretty impressive name, you know, for, for things such as X-Men and uh, X-Men First Class and, and everything. So, so how did you guys actually uh, become involved with, with Brian? How did he become involved with H Plus? We, went, you know, shortly after we conceived of the idea, Cosmo and I sort of just sat down and we just looked at what this was. What this, and in the beginning, back in 2006, it really wasn't much more than a kernel of an idea and a, a world that we wanted to build around this, right? So that's to say we wanted to explore what people all around the world would be dealing with if something like this happened, what, uh, what the world would look like in the years prior to it, not just an, an American story, but we really wanted this to be an international story. And we, we started building this world and eventually we got to a place where we didn't have a script, but we just had all of these stories that took place in this very rich and detailed world. So we started taking it around, showing it to people. Uh, we sat down with people in television, in film, um, and, and one of those people was Brian. We sat down with, with him and his producers, and they, uh, they loved it. They thought it was fantastic. Um, but they thought that the, uh, that the way that we wanted to tell the story, we really, we were really set on trying to tell as many of those stories from this world as we could, and to paint a larger story through a kind of nonlinear format, allowing the audience to, to a degree, 
challenging the audience to a degree to sort of piece the puzzle together. Um, and, uh, and although we had seen a little bit of that kind of, of storytelling on television, um, Lost was certainly doing some things like that, um, it, really was, it really was a concept that didn't seem to fit perfectly into television. And mm-hmm. Brian really wanted to explore the Internet. He was really interested in, in, in doing something on the Internet, but he, he really, if, if he was going to do something on the Internet, he wanted it to be big. He wanted it to be filmic and, uh, and on par, anything on par with, with, uh, with uh, great television. And so we just started exploring it as a web series. We showed it to Warner Digital. They loved it. Um, it was totally, you know, the, the type of content that they wanted to be creating. And shortly after, we got to writing. So as, you know, it wasn't until we actually sold the idea and, and, and you know, and, and signed our, our deal with, with Warner Brothers that we actually picked up a pen and actually started writing any of the story. Up until then, it was really just ideas, you mm-hmm. know, a, a lot of notes and research. And then from about 2008 through to 2011, when we shot it, um, it was a, a development process, figuring out how to write this thing. Um, and, and that was very much a collaborative effort between myself, Cosimo, Warner Brothers, and Brian. Cool. Um, I mean, I'm, I've, I've actually been looking at your uh, IMDb profile, and, um, you know, I, I saw Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip pop up, and I thought, now there's a series that was cancelled before its time. Um but I'm looking. I was looking at your writing credits. You've not really done. You've not really done a great deal that's listed on IMDb as writing. And H plus is one of those projects. And um, I, I'm just wondering, um, what 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 sort of writing do you, do you do? Are you are you sort of like primarily interested in science fiction and futurism as a writer, or or or, or is is there a sitcom in you as well, or something? Well, uh, I think you also see on my IMDb profile that I wrote a, a project called The Homes, which mm-hmm. is uh, which was a series um, uh, that it was a, a series about a, a group of, of teenagers who travel across country, um, you know, to from Pennsylvania to uh, to, to Los Angeles, um, and uh, and it's uh, told through indie rock music. So uh, my 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 interests are certainly wide. Um, that said, I would probably I would probably categorize myself as a cerebral uh, writer um, who who gravitates more to genre and in particular sci-fi, um, cerebral sci-fi, if anything. Um, and uh, and yeah, uh, I mean what you're seeing there is accurate. I mean H plus, and it's sort of one of the incredible things, a testament to all of the people at Warner Brothers and. Um, and, and Brian for the trust that they put in two young writers who really hadn't written anything before this. Um, you know, back in 2008, seven, eight, when we p- pitched this to, to Warner Brothers and, and, uh, and Brian, we were totally new to all of this. Um, and we really spent the past four years becoming writers, becoming executive producers, learning not just how to write um, this type of, 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 uh, of, of subject, but how to work within the studio system, which is a completely different animal altogether, right? Um, how to work with, with uh, people at that level, because there's a lot of challenges that come in. You have an idea, but now you have to realize it within a, very, within a system that works in a, in a very specific way. Um, that was exciting. And, and since then, you know, now, uh, I mean, I'm writing several projects, n- none of which are, are listed on IMDb yet, but, um, but I have other projects in the works uh, currently, um, both in, in, uh, in digital space as well as in, in film. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite, you know, ba- based on what, what, what you guys have done so far in Age for Us, you know, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in, you know, having a look at some of the other stuff you've done. Um, you know, uh, you know, so because you know, so far what I've seen of H plus, I've, I've, I've really, really enjoyed. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty scary stuff, but at the same time, it's uh, pretty compelling stuff. And I like the way that you've ended each episode on 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 some pretty wild cliffhangers. It's it's almost yeah. it's almost in a way it's kind of like watching. It's kind of like harking back in a way. You know, the way you've written your cliffhangers to the old movie serials of the 1930s. I'm not sure if that's what he was going for, if that was the intended result, but it does kind of hat back. <laughs> well, what's, I think what's really exciting about this medium in general, the digital medium, is uh, you know there, there are no there are no specific rules yet to format, right? Um, and so we can actually explore some older forms of storytelling that that we really haven't seen on television in, as you said, like. 50, 60, 70 years, you know, like 
you know, the, the, or, or just in general, they're, they're just not, they're just not forms of storytelling that we're used to, uh, anymore because we've been given these hour long, half hour long formats on television, these two hour long formats, um, for, uh, for feature films. And that's sort of what we expect our storytelling to be. Um, and I don't know how long that's going to last. I, I have, I have a feeling that, that, you know, probably the internet space is going to start to to look a lot more like television as the years go by. We're already starting to see it, but at this at this point in time, it's a really fun time for writers, creators to be creating stuff in the space because mm-hmm. there are no rules um, for what you can create, and 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 so. You know, we, we created a 48 episode series, right? It's, it's about three and a half hours worth of content, but we chose to tell the story in small, you know, four minute, you know, four minute long episodes, um, that span of, you know, a, a timeline of over a decade and are all over the world. And, and, uh, you know, we're really excited about that, that form of storytelling. Um, how long people will be able to experiment in that way, it's, it's hard to say, but it's fun that we can do it now. I think I actually read something somewhere that, you know, you, you, you've released the, uh, you've been releasing the episodes in a specific order, but they can actually be watched in any order that the, uh, per, that the person watching chooses. Yeah, it's exa- that's exactly right. You know, um, we've been talking about that since the beginning. In fact, that was part of the original conceit, what, what we talked to, to Brian about many years ago, and, and, and this idea that, you know, we really, we really wanted this to be a flexible series. We wanted this to be something that people were going to treat less as a sit-back and escape experience and more of a lean forward and explore experience. Um, and we wanted to give them something that they could really look at in all angles. Um, and, uh, and, and so, yeah, since, gosh, since 2008, we've been talking about this idea that, wow, wouldn't it be great if audiences actually take these episodes and reorder them into, in, into different batches, into, you know, chronological order or, you know, by character or, mm-hmm. or, or whatnot. And, what we're seeing is that's starting to happen. And what's really exciting is back then, in 2008, we really, we really didn't know how we were going to do it. We just said, you know, it'd be great if somehow by the time we get this out, there's a way. Maybe we'll create a website and let people do it. But we're distributing it through YouTube. Um, you know, we're, we're an official YouTube channel, an official YouTube partner. Um, and uh, and, and the, the, the YouTube playlist feature is just absolutely perfect for this form of storytelling. People can create playlists out of episodes in any order that they want. And, uh, and they can watch the series. If, if people don't like watching it at this four-minute, these small four-minute pieces, they can cr- construct playlists that are a half hour long, an hour long if they want. Um, you know, it will take a little bit more time for more episodes to come out. Um, but, uh, you know, for people who wait a month for a new comic book to come out, I don't think that it's, uh, you know, too much of a stretch in that regard. Um, but what's fun is that they can actually rewatch the series in different ways and actually get, get different experiences out of each one and gain a certain amount of clarity, uh, depending on, on the order that they watch it in. Mm-hmm. I didn't, in fact, I actually just recently watched a playlist that somebody had created and I saw two episodes back to back that I never in the four years that I've been working on the series ever considered to watching these two episodes back to back. And they actually had a really key piece of information in them that, you know, I sort of knew was there, but it didn't have quite the resonance until I watched those two back to back. So there's re- it's really an exciting, it's an exciting format for us, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, it almost, it almost, it almost feels like uh, you as the creators, you just sort of like thrown out there and, um, you know, you're leaving it to the audience to sort of create their own playlist and, and you're sort of like getting that, you're getting a lot of positive feedback through that. Through, through other people's creativity and how they've sort of like constructed their playlist as in what order they constructed it in as well. Exactly. I mean, you know, we're not, we're not really empowering people to retell our story or to, to, to tell our story, but we're, a lot, we're empowering the audiences to sort of create their own experience out of the story, right? The events mm-hmm. of the story are going to always remain the same, no matter how the, how the, the series is rearranged. But depending on how it's rearranged, they, they will get different experiences out of it. Yeah, it almost reminds me of one of those uh, books. I think you used to get them in the 80s. Uh, um, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of the Indiana Jones films from way back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember getting these books where, you know, uh, you got to a cliffhanger, a particular chapter, and it said, uh, 
you know, if you want to do such and such thing, turn to chapter such and such, or if you want to do such and yeah. such thing, turn to such and such and such. Oh, yeah. you've just died. Choose your own adventures. <laughs> yeah. Choose your own adventure series. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, there's something, there's something enjoyable about having control over the way that we consume the content. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, can can you actually ever see H plus going into the realm of video games or comic books, or do you think it's primarily just going to be web series? I would love to see it uh, go into other medium. Um, I think that you know it would be fantastic to see a comic book out of H plus. I think that it would be great. Um, I mean, a, a video game would just be incredible. Um, you know, but also I I I think that there's a there's a scenario where H plus we do see H plus in another of of the more older you know. Uh, uh, formats like television or film. Um, of course, if it went to one of those other mediums, comic book, television, film, whatever, um, it would probably, it would likely be a very different looking and different feeling experience from, from a, you know, a viewer standpoint. We, we would have to reimagine the way that the story is told because the way we wrote this series was so distinctly for the internet. Um, and, uh, but we do think that this is, that, that, that there's a, a big world here. You know, I mean, H plus is, is a really, has a really dense mythology and has a really, really wide world. Um, and, uh, and so I think that you can tell stories in this world in a variety of ways, novels, uh, you know, comic books, television shows, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, always, it's something I noticed and I was, I saw, you know, as I was watching through, through the, uh, five or six sides that I did manage to sort of like, uh, you know, view, it kind of occurred to me, this, this would actually make a re, you know, pretty good video game. Um, you know, if, if we could actually keep the, the, the uh, film elements in it, in, as opposed to going with CGI graphics or something like that, just keep the film elements uh, to yeah. it. Um, a bit like the old, uh, the old FMV games sort of thing. Um, because you know you used to have you know games quite a lot on PC. I don't think the, I don't think there is um, out there now as they once were, where you know the game would sort of like be a movie, and then when it once it required you to take action, it would then switch to a uh, something that was a bit more computer graphics driven. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, like with like cut scenes and whatnot. Yeah. yeah and an example that I can think of really is uh, probably the you know the second or third Wing Commander game. Um, mm. Which is going quite way back to the nineties, but I, I could, I could yeah. see it being something like that, um, as well as a comic book, because you know, based, basically, I, I, uh, I, I'm one of these uh, guys that has to have my monthly fix of comics. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, you know, you, you're talking to a, you're talking to a, you know, fan of comics, fan of film and television. So, and I just love it all. I'm happy to have it. Um, That's great. You've done sort of like 48 episodes of H Plus. Um, um, yes. as, as you said, it's over three hours long. Uh, do you think we will likely see an additional 40 episodes or 48 episodes in years to come, or is it just all one self-contained story? Oh no, it's definitely not one self-contained story. I mean, the, 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 there will be there will be a lot of questions still unanswered. Um, a lot of questions will be answered, but. But, um, you know, this was written as a first season, no mm-hmm. question about it. Um, and, uh, and, and we are already in, in development on uh, a season two. So, um, you know, whether or not that development process eventually um, yields another fully produced series, that's sort of still yet to, to, to be seen. Um, but I can say right now that there is more story to be told for sure. And we are already working on that. Cool. I mean, I first learned about H Plus uh, originally. I heard about it initially back in 2011, shortly after Comic Con. Um, mm-hmm. At which point, I I actually started working as a as 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 a as a producer with my friend Mark Pyle on a on a web series called Reality on Demand, which we released mm-hmm. earlier in the year. Um, and uh, you know, I, I kind of got to ask you this: uh, there's, there's a heck of a lot of uh, great stuff out there. On, on the web in, in the form of web series. And I'm just wondering if as a medium, you, you can ever, ever see, see it becoming a, a more mainstream than, than, than they are now, you know, the web series. And, um, because I, 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 I've already started kind of looking at them as a new version of syndicated television in, in that they don't really have the budget of the, of the big networks, you know, they don't even have the big, the budget of, the um, of most syndicated TV shows, but I'm just wondering if you can see them becoming more mainstream as the years go on. 
Uh, I definitely think so. I, I think that you, you, we've already seen it just in the past several years. Um, Hulu and Netflix, the, the type of programming that they're creating, which is, I mean, essentially web, web content. I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly, it's certainly related to television more than the traditional web series is. Um, but H plus is not the only one of its kind. There are several web series with very high production values and great writing um, that are are already out and are about to come out. In fact, our, our, the director Stuart Hendler, who directed uh, um, who directed H plus, has the, the new Halo series that he directed um, coming out next oh. month. Um, so, uh, so absolutely, um, web series, you know, has for a very long time had this stigma around it, which was, you know, that the web Web content was the lesser content. It was the it was the the series for creators who couldn't get a television series, and that is quickly changing. We're starting to see um, big name stars uh, both behind and in front of the camera uh, working on web series, um, and it, it's actually not like what we're seeing here is not much different than the the big cable revolution that we saw, um, you know, in the uh, in the nineties. Um, where we're starting to, to see this great shift happen, or what, back then we saw a great shift happen with television, um, you know, in, in terms of its quality, its quality level. Um, we're starting to see the same thing here with web series. Uh, I, I remember two decades ago, television f- for, for people who really aspired to greatness in the entertainment industry, television was always seen as a stepping stone. It was always seen as a means to, the, to an end, which was the end being feature films, was mm-hmm. doing big, you know, big theatrical projects, whether you were a director, an actor, a producer, whatever. Now, fast forward to 2012, when we have shows like Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, Dexter, these phenomenal pieces of storytelling on television, and actors, you know, huge feature film actors now, uh, you know, in, in television shows. So just in 20 years, how far television has come, um, I imagine that if we fast forward 10 years into the future, perhaps, we'll see something very similar with web series. We'll start to see web series that are, uh, you know, as good, if not better content than anything that you see at the movie theater. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the one thing that I've noticed is a lot of the um, a lot of indie film creators are actually uh, moving towards towards web series. I mean, for example, my my friend Matt, who told me about H Plus initially, uh, um, he he's gone from he's gone from you know studying a psychology degree psychology degree to working in you know in in various jobs um, to moving out to Vancouver to go to film school in Vancouver so he could actually uh, fulfil his lifelong dream of becoming a filmmaker. And um, and now he's, he's getting involved in all sorts of web series, and it's it's great to see. And uh, the, the the wonderful thing is, is um, you know, Marx is pretty much on it in regards to um, every every web series that comes out. Um, you know, he saw like he was give me an email, and you know, and he was sort of like say, oh, you you got to check this out. <laughs> Um, so yeah, he, he's he's pretty much on 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 the cusp of what's happening, and uh, you know, I I, I just um, I, I just think it's um, it, it's amazing to see see it all happening, um, and um, at the same time, it's kind of difficult to keep up with because there's so much going on. Yeah, well, I, I definitely think that web series. There's a, a lot of similarities between what's happening with web series right now and what what happened with independent filmmaking in the '90s. Definitely, and there's no. It's, I don't think it's any surprise that we're seeing more and more. Um, you know, filmmakers gravitating towards the web format, you know, mm-hmm. for the same reasons, you know, you can create something that a lot of people can see, uh, you can do it on your terms, um, and, uh, and and that's a really exciting place to be if you're a creator, I think. Indeed it, 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 it is, I mean, um, it's, you know, it, there's a lot of great stuff out there, as I say, I mean, I just, um, I, I just got through uh, watching uh, a new one called Drift a Broken Road um, a few weeks back. And um, I interviewed the creator of that a few weeks back as well, um, and and that's um, that's actually a great that's kind of like a post-apocalyptic western, um, if you will. But, oh, cool. it's, but it's not post-apocalypse in in the form of um, a nuking a weapon or or any or, or anything like that. It's just a case of um, society is just broken down to a point where there's, there's been another civil war. But instead of it being north versus south, it was just sort of like basically every man for himself uh, and, and various militias, right. you know, formed. 
So that, that, that's, that was an interesting one. And, um, you know, H, H plus is a really interesting one in, 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 in regards to, you know, how it's talking about technology and stuff like that. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're really excited about all of the dialogue that we're seeing around the series and, and, and about some of these, these, these debates in regards to, te- to technology, um, you know, and, 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 and how technology is, is, is advancing and progressing and, and, and sort of embedding, embedding itself deeper into our humanity as, as we go. And, and I think that if we can, if, if this series is successful to me, um, that would mean the series, uh, has really, um, formed communities, uh, around a lot of these themes and topics. Um, if, if anything, that was what we, we wanted to see from this series, um, most was real communities forming around discussing the, not just the mysteries in the series, but but also some of these topics that you say, you know, these these uh, you know themes uh, regarding technology and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that, that's about all I have, John. I just want to thank you very much for your time. It's been absolutely brilliant speaking to you about it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, my pleasure. And I'm, I'm going to look forward to, uh, you know, trying trying to find uh, a, a few more minutes to watch a bit more H Plus later on. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, it's always uh, interesting to to actually talk to uh, you know creative people for me. It's something that I I, I quite enjoy. I quite enjoy you know hear, hear, hearing hearing uh, you know how, how they came up with with various ideas and themes for for, for what they what they're doing. And uh, you know, so it's always a uh, you know a great a great source of enjoyment for me to so I hear about 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 how 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 these ideas come about. Oh uh, well, my pleasure. Okay. Oh, thanks a lot. It's been been wonderful speaking to you, and the best of luck with the uh, H Plus. I hope you do get that second season. Thanks very much. And that was the uh, creator of uh, H Plus, uh, one one of the two writers of H Plus, uh, John Cabrera. Um, he, you know, he's really great to speak to. It was a really interesting conversation. I really enjoyed speaking to him. And you know, hopefully we get to do it again next year when you know if they if they get a second series. Um, anyway. Um, just going to finish off with a with a with a news roundup for this week. There's been quite a lot happening in sci-fi this week, and uh, we've actually got a fairly new story in as well, which we'll sort of save to the very last actually. But here we go. Um, this this is a bit of exciting news for um, fans of the Dresden Files. Um, I'm a big fan of the Dresden Files books myself uh, by Jim Butcher, and um, for a while now, Dynamite. Dynamite Entertainment have actually been doing they've actually been doing um, comic book adaptations of of, of the, the Dresden novels. They, like, they've done the first two, and they did one original one, which was kind of like a prequel to the first two. Well, now that they, they, you know they've got Jim Butcher to do um, to do another original story, um, which is going to be called Ghoul Goblin. And it's a, it's a, it's an original Dresden style story. I'll, I'll just quickly read the press release to you. It's really um, sounds really interesting. Uh, acclaimed author Jim Butcher pens new stories in the Dresden Files universe as a comic book series with Jim Butcher's Dresden Files Ghoul Goblin One, um, which is co-written by Matt Powers and drawn by drawn by Joseph Cooper. Uh, Jim Butcher's Dresden Files Ghoul Goblin One features covers from acclaimed artists. Um, Adrian Batgirl CF, um, and it's coming in January 2013. Uh, Jim Butcher's Dresden Files Goo Goblin 1. Harry Dresden has survived the events of Full Moon, barely, but all is not, not, all is not well in his world. He's still alienated from his closest friend, Karen Murphy, and on exceedingly poor terms with Chicago's number one gangster, John Marcone. And that's just the small stuff. The creatures of the November of the of the of the Never Never uh, don't take vacations, and I'm particularly worried about Harry's friendship or love life. Um, it's an honor to be a part of a brand new, never before seen story set in the Dresden verse, says co-writer Mark Powers. Under Jim's watchful eye, we are doing everything in our power to create something worthy of the mythos. Uh, working with Jim. Rich and, and the entire Dynamite crew on Dresden has been an absolute thrill, as artist Joe Cooper. I love the Dresden Files, monsters, magic and mayhem. Um, what's not to love? I am truly excited and honoured for, for the opportunity to spend some time in Harry's world. This series should have a little something for everyone. I hope fans of the book, books and those picking it up for the first time 
have as much fun reading it as I have had drawing it. Hold on to your hat, should be a wild ride. Um, having been involved editing the Dresden Files comic series from, from almost day one, and being a fan of novels of the novels myself, it's been fun to see Harry come 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 to fore come alive. From different artists' perspectives, states Dynamite Director of Business Development, Rich Young. I think people are really going to enjoy Joel's take on the Dresden universe while, while getting a chance to read a great all new original story from Jim and Mark. Um, and that comes out in January, and um, you know I've got to go admit, as as a fan of Dressing Flowers, I'm actually looking forward to sort of like uh, getting a bit of that action myself. In fact, I actually sort of like uh, put it on my list um, this, this afternoon. I rang my comic store, um, so there we go. And another story here is um, this is one for Battlestar Galactica fans. It's also Dynamite comp, Dynamite uh, Entertainment. Um, you know, they're, they're doing a lot this week. Um, they, they, you know, in fact, I was sent about four press releases from, from Dynamite Entertainment this week. Um, and, you know, they, you know they're, they're doing a hang of a lot. Um, but this is one that really caught my eye. Um, apparently, Andy Abney, oh, sorry, sorry, um, Dan Abnett and Andy Manning are actually going to be doing um, a, new, a, a new song I take on the 1978 Battlestar Galactica license. It's basically, you know, it's within that 1978 universe, so it will not be as dark or as gritty or as making you want to reach for a for a, for a, for, a, for a Magnum 45 and blowing your brains out as the um, sci-fi version was, uh, which was pretty pretty depressing. <laughs> um, anyway, um, this is what they they have to say about it. Um, I'm looking forward to working with Dynamite on this Battlestar Galactica project says writer Dan Abnett. I've been a fan of Battlestar Galactica since I was a kid, and it's going to be great for Andy and I to get, get our, co our, our Cosmic Mihon teeth into such a long-standing and beloved science fiction franchise. Um, growing up in, in, in the 70s, I was hooked on sci-fi, as writer Andy Manning. As a kid, I couldn't get enough of it. Uh, comics in the UK like Action and 2000 AD, as well as all the Marvel and DC titles, I could hunt down. Star Wars, took, Star Wars took, took things to a new high, and in its, in its wake, there followed a flood of sci-fi entertainment buying up up. The original series of Battlestar Galactica was like catnip to my younger self. Morgan singing my rabid and craving spaceships, laser weapons, robots, and alien invasions. It had two characters, snappy dialogue, creepy alien cyborgs, awesome space battles um, with fantastic special effects. It was 1978, cut me some snack, and a totally cute robot dog. So imagine the thrill and excitement to be given the chance to develop something in the Battlestar Galactica universe, to get to play with characters and concepts that I've grown up with that are such part of my formative years. With this new series from Dynamite, Dan and I are hoping we can add to the established canon and con of continuity with our own take on the classic series. I know my inner 14-year-old is squealing with delight at this opportunity. I'm still holding on hope that one day I'll get my own daggett to, too. Um, that was a quote from Andy Ganning. Um, with the 35th anniversary of the 1978 Battlestar Galactica series just around the corner, we are incredibly excited to be working with our friends at Dynamite again to explore the further adventures of the Galactica Galactica crew, said Chris Muccio, uh, Director of Licensing for, U for NBC Universal Television uh, Consumed Products. Um, and, as, as, and as an iPhone comics fan, have, having Dan and Dandy bring their Galactic expertise to Battlestar Galactic Universe is a huge privilege too. Uh, DNA brings the, brings a bang to Dynamite. We, we, we haven't released new classic Battlestar Galactic series for a bit, waiting for the right writer to bring their adventures back to... to, 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 to. Um, little did we know that it would be two writers to relaunch this universe. Uh, very few comics writers tell awesome epic space adventures as Dan and Andy do. Uh, reviewing 
renewing their contract and signing Dan and Andy to write a series as important as Battlestar Galactica is a great combination. Dan and Andy were meant to write Battlestar Galactica and they'll be exploring the universe featuring Starbuck, Pogo, Adama and all the characters we know and love. Oh, frack. Oh, frack it. And they'll be signing on to fight too, uh, states Dynamite President Nick Bar Barushi. So, yeah, Battlestar Galactica, that's another one I pre-ordered today. I'm excited about that one too. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, another bit of news. Uh, this just broke here today, actually, um, and this is one for Dot Two fans. And you can actually get this um, at the moment on um, it's on the BBC's website, um, but it's also on it's also on Sci-Fi Post. We posted it there as well. Uh, basically, uh, in the uh, last series of Doctor Who. Um, you know, before Amy and Rory are written out, uh, we actually got to meet Amy's dad, who's played by Mark Williams. He was called Brian Williams, I think. Um, and, you know, you know, unfortunately, um, we didn't get any closure on what, what, what his father did. And the BBC have released a, a, a bit of a storyboard. It's called PS. And it was meant to be... Uh, it, it, it was never actually included in the um, in the mid-season finale, but you know, and it's a shame it wasn't because it's quite a touching middle uh, middle scene, and you know, we kind of learn a little bit, little bit about uh, the fate of Rory and of Rory and Amy uh, via it as well, as long as the fate of Brian, who sort of basically stayed behind and looked after their home for them while they were gone. Um, so, you know. It's, it's well worth a watch if you're a big Dot 2 fan and you haven't seen it already, you can check it out. It's called uh, Dot 2 PS. Um, and it's actually on YouTube as well, so you can, you know, it's, it's worth checking out. Uh, trust me on this, you'll like it. And I'm sorry, I got the sniffles here. Um, and another bit of news uh, regarding Daredevil. Um, you know, not, not, you know, basically the movie Daredevil. Um, Released in 2003, um, apparently, um, so like Fox, who won't, who had the rights until nearly this week, uh, the rights have now reverted back to Marvel. Um, but Fox were so like talking about doing a reboot of Daredevil, they were talking about a sequel, but it, it never came to pass. But the rights have actually now wound up back in back with Marvel. Um, and and basically, you know, so like, uh, you've got to ask yourself about the fate of the Daredevil movies. What's going to happen? Um, because, you know, it's so like, um, I reported this uh, news earlier today, and um, it actually came out on Wednesday. So I was a bit made, on, on, made, made to the uh, party on this one. But there are a few possibilities for the character of Daredevil. Um, because in the uh, New Avengers comic book, series, uh, Daredevil has actually just joined the lineup. So, you know, you've got to wonder, you know, given now that the rights are actually now back with Marvel, um, would there be a possibility maybe of them sort of like uh, including uh, Daredevil in the lineup for Avengers 2 or or something, you know, as a way of sort of like, uh, you know, softly introducing him for sort of like his own individual movie. Um, you never know. It might be worth watching out to see what's going to happen with uh, with Daredevil in the future because it's a it's a pretty good character. And Arrow, Arrow premiered earlier this week. Yay! And it was a good series. I quite enjoyed the pilot episode. Um, but in a recent in interview, Andrew Andrew Kreisberg, is it? Um, he he actually told Snyder about. Um, about, about his experience of casting John Barrowman on the show. And this is what he said. He said, I'm a nice long fan of Doc I'm a nice long Doctor Who fan. Uh, I like Peter Davison and Colin Baker. Um, so when John Barrowman's name came up for the part, I basically laid out the plan that we had for his character and who he is and how he relates to everyone, everybody and, that's going, and, and what's going on. Because we don't have, have a lot written. I said, so, I guess I'm asking you to take a leap of faith, he said. Uh, John said, said to John Barrowman, um, it's funny, seven years ago, former Who showrunner Russell T. Davis told me to take, take a leap of faith with him. And I hear your passion and creativity uh, the, way, the way I heard his. So let's do it. Um, 
that was the best phone call I I I I I've ever gotten. So there we go. Um, you know, um, a bit bit of a bit of fanboy stuff going on there within Arrow. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, Perriman's role on Arrow is different from his character of Captain Jack Hartless. Um, he's just such a tremendously talented actor, and and his casting is one of the things we're most proud of with the show. Uh, Kreisberg's fellow producer, Mark, fellow producer Mark Guggenheim, uh, calls Barrowman incredibly magnetic and incredibly charming. Um, however, unlike Kreisberg, Guggenheim has never seen Torchwood. Um, I'll be honest, he said, I haven't seen Torchwood, and not having seen him in Torchwood, I come to his performance on my own terms, he explained. Uh, John lights up the screen, and he really energises the actors around that, 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 that he has scenes with. So there we go. Um, so a lot of good things being said about uh, about, about John Barrowman, uh, who's born in Scotland, by the way. <laughs> he's born in Scotland. He moved to uh, moved to America when he was a kid, hence why he's got the accent. Um, but you know, he's all right. He's pretty much um, a Brit through and through, really. Um, last bit of news. This is this is something like uh, recently just broken today, as in a matter of hours ago. Um, actually broke at 12, 12.09 uh, p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And the uh, the remake, the reboot of Creech from the Black Lagoon has found a writer. Um, apparently, according to Hollywood Reporter, horror scribe Dave, Dave, Dave Kaginovich, um, or whatever, uh, who wrote Invasion and is working on remakes of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. it understand. Uh, Kabinovich, um, who wrote the Daniel Craig, Nicole Kidman thriller, The Invasion several years ago, has been tapped pen Universal's remake of Creature from, from the Black Lagoon. Um, Eric Newman and Mark Abraham of, a, um, of Strike Entertainment are producing, as well as Gary Ross and Alison Thomas, Thomas by their larger than life productions. Ross's father was one of the writers on the original. Uh, despite any reports, Cal Rinch is not attached to direct. Uh, the 1954 movie centered on a prehistoric water-breathing humanoid monster that lived in a remote Amazonian river and a group of scientists that wanted to study him. Uh, the studio has been trying to remake the title since the early 1980s, and Kedrush is, is starting from scratch. Um, the scribe is known for his horror script, Invasion was a remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and while the movie production was troubled, it paved the way for him to work on the remake, Pet Cemetery. Recently, he worked on, high profile, on a high-profile adaptation of Stephen King's It and The Stand, which are in development at Warner's. Um, he's read by UTA, Madhouse Entertainment, and, and Jackaway Timer. Uh, Universal's VP Production, um, Anika McLaren, and the creative exec Sarah Scott are overseeing the project for the studio. Uh, Christelle Nab Nablin will exec produce the strike. So there we go. Um, you know, so I can't remember the name of the uh, director, but someone else was attached to Creature from that movie a while back. So I kind of remember a part on that uh, vaguely uh, a few years back. But yeah, we've got a couple more minutes to kill. Um, so let's see. What else is out there? Um, looking at the uh, Hollywood Reporter um, to see see what 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 other news we have here. Um, ah, here's a here's an interesting uh, little thing. Uh, New York Comic Con creator-owned Insurgent Comics is coming from DC. This is somewhat of an exclusive. Also released today at about um, 3:21 p.m. So it's only a couple of hours out, this uh, story. Uh, the futuristic title is set in a world where terrorism has been defeated thanks to US government-created sleeper agents. Uh, DC Entertainment is launching its first comic that is creator-owned and has no connection to either Vertigo or the main DC universe since the launch of the company's reboot, The New, the new 52. Uh, written by, and created by F.J. DeSanto and Todd Farmer, Insurgent is a six-issue miniseries drawn by Federico that, 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 uh, that is steeped 
in high-tech military hardware and political conspiracy. It's due to hit shelves in January. So that's quite an interesting thing. Um, according to Farmer, it is set in a world where terrorism has been defeated thanks to US government created sleeper agents. It was happening it was happening ever after until the sleepers started waking on their own and killing without remorse for the wrong side, said Farmer. John Ravain, a retired government hunter, is forced out of retirement not to hunt terrorists but to track down and terminate ordinary sales clerks and shop owners now turned into ruthless killers. The origin of the book goes back several years when DeSanto, producer of the spirits, and Farmer, the screenwriter behind My Bloody Valentine and Drive Angry, were chatting about movies and comics they liked, such as Blade Runner and Magnus Robot Fighter. Uh, the talk turned, turned to creating something new. It would marry the leading age futurism themes like nanotechnology and trans transhumanism with big halo and gears of war style military action and, and still be rooted in strong characters with personal motivations, said DeSanto. Also, by setting the story in the very near future, we could take advantage of today's political climate of distrust and paranoia. The book was originally intended to come from Wildstorm's DC division, run by superstar artist Jim Lee. When Lee became a publisher of DC and, and, the, arm, and, and the arm shuttered, m m many of the division's projects fell through the cracks. Lee, however, liked Insurgent enough to make sure it got published. Um, it exists on its own, and we feel really fortunate that DC gave us the freedom to do what was best to drive the story and characters, said DeSanto. Um, if anything, it fits more in with New World DC Entertainment emphasis on the E. Um, and with the creator's Hollywood pedigree, don't be surprised if Insurgent gets a look, look or two by some savvy exec for possible adaptation. So oh, there we go. That sounds like a really, really interesting, um, in, interesting comic book there. So, you know, we, we're just gonna have to wait and see what that that, that turns out like. Um, anyway, um, you know, that's about it for this week. Um, I'd like to thank you all for listening. It's been, it's been a, um, it's been, it's been, been a great, great, you know, a great, great chance to work. So I like. Uh, you know, talk about web series uh, with the interview with um, John Cabrera earlier. Um, so, you know, it's time for me to go. Um, so, um, just before I do go, I just want to let you know that uh, we have Jeff Trek coming up tomorrow. Um, not sure what Jeff has on ha has 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 on the uh, on on the burner for tomorrow, but um, he'll be um, airing at about half five um, Eastern Standard Time tomorrow on this channel with uh, Jeff Trek. I think he's doing a series of fan shows um, where he's getting some like, very well-known fans to uh, come on the show and discuss Star Trek with him. So um, I think it's the third part of that tomorrow. Um, there's not going to be any John Retainment on a Tuesday, unfortunately, um, due to the fact that uh, Matt Pyle is out on a secret mission. Um, and no doubt getting more great content for the show, um, as well as this show. Um, and there, there will be a genre entertainment on Thursday, however. So if you look out for that on Thursday, it starts at um, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Thursday. Uh, they'll have um, a few cast members on from the uh, popular web series Eight and Five, and they'll also have a have 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 a, have a band on um, who who do the music for. Uh, Oh God! They did new music for a, for, a, for a British web series um, called I think it's called Woodbone in China. So you know, have a look out for that. That's on Thursday on this channel at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, you know, 6 p.m. Central Time, which I should imagine is around about 4 p.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time. Um, I'm not sure when the clocks go back or forward or whatever, but you know, keep an eye out for that um, on Thursday. So probably worth uh, missing out for if you're a fan of web series. Um, anyway, that's all I have for this week. Um, nice to thank you all. And next week, we actually have a great interview coming up. Um, I've not scheduled it yet, but keeping a look out for it. Same time next Friday, we have um, Ron Shusette, 
um, be a screenwriter who penned Alien, Alien, Total Recall, um, Minority Report, and the, uh, the 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 not very much, not very well appreciated film Free Jack. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, again, thanks for listening, and we'll be back at you next week. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather. In regards to technology, the world was in a, a, a different place, at least, you know, in, in terms of our, our smart devices. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, we were, the, the idea sort of came from this, uh, you know, this, this sense that we were getting uh, about our, our, our connectivity and our vulnerability when not connected. Uh, I was actually uh, driving through a parking lot back by sometime in 2006, and I remember my, my radio started going off um, in the car, and, and, uh, and it was a really good song, and I stopped the car, and of course, you know, backed up traffic behind me, and, and uh, finally went into the lot, lost the song, and I think it was in that moment that it sort of, it sort of struck me how vulnerable we, we really are when we uh, when we are disconnected and that kernel of an idea somehow it sort of morphed into this this idea of a world implanted with computers because really um, you know whether they're inside our bodies or inside our pockets this technology really has sort of embedded itself into our humanity um, we, we treat our phones like they are a part of us when we lose them we we get terrified you know for for uh for a few moments and and if we really did lose them you know we're, we're going you know weeks of of repair trying to um get everything back together so um we really wanted to explore this relationship between our tools um and, and uh and and really what evolved into this and and because of that, I think that, you know, all, all of the real fears that we have with technology today um, can easily be transferred over to this, uh, you know, to, to the technology that we, we talked about here in, in the series. Um, and I don't necessarily think that that makes this a doomsday scenario. Um, you know, I, I, I actually don't really believe in doomsday scenarios. I think that doomsday is always uh, is always sort of um, subjective, right? Like you... you uh, you like you only feel like you're in an apo- or you only think it's an apocalypse while you're in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know the hum- human human story has included several apocalypses by by our definition, um, and we always seem to get past them, right? The bubonic plague killed off half of Europe, you know, as much as half of half of Europe. Um, we got past it, um, and uh, and and I think that in a series like this, if anything, these sorts of dangers. What's so I think the, the more interesting question here is why we as a species always seem willing to take these great risks, you know, great risks that come with nuclear energy, with genetically modifying our foods. We understand that they come with a really uh, a great, um, great risk and, and could, could cause catastrophic, um, you know, uh, happenings that, that could really uh, take down the species as, as we know it. And yet we, we do them anyway. And, and I think- Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Today, Irish biotech startup H plus Nano. A new breakthrough in implantation technology might just pave the way. Computers in the brain? Sound like science fiction? Well, not according to H plus Nano. The company has just released a medical implant that they say was more than just emerging of man and machine. H plus. The world is in you. You're always online. You're always connected. With me right now is uh, John Cabrera, uh, the uh, writer and executive producer of the exciting new sci-fi web series. Yes, believe it or not, I did say web series, uh, H+. How are you doing, John? 
I'm well. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. I've, I've actually just been watching this web series of yours, um, and you know, I, I just got to say, it's, it's, it's really, really, really good. It's kind of scary in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, how, how, how did the actual idea come about uh, for, for it? Uh, we have been writing this for, well, it's been in Cosmo in my life for um, six years. We conceived the idea back in 2006, and to give you a little perspective, that was uh, before the iPhone came out. So, uh, uh, five episodes so far, I, I just saw that I've been cramming them in wherever I can over the last couple of days. Um, yeah, that's sort of the that's that's the the appeal, right? Like popcorn, you know, you can just munch a few when you when you have a chance. Yeah, that, that that's kind of the appeal, but you know, ring with me, I I prefer you know when I can, um, but I'm so busy that I can't right now. But when 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 it comes to web series, ring, really, I just prefer to watch them all in one go if all parts are available. Mm-hmm. I would just sort of try and sit down for a whole hour, and and watch the whole lot. Um, but, you know, the, the one thing that struck me is, um, you know, a virus hits and, and everyone dies. And, um, you know, I was kind of like thinking, well, that's kind of like very, sort of like, uh, very, very, very real. And, very, and it was a very real fear about what could happen now. But you've got people walking around with pacemakers that are run by microchips and God only knows what sort of thing. So, you know, this, this stuff could actually happen. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the the the, uh, the world that we paint in the in the series is definitely one that we, you know, that we we sort of built through a lot of research, and uh, much of the technology that we talk about in the series is either, you know, in its it's either technology that actually exists in a very rudimentary form, or another technology exists in a at least a rudimentary form that um, we imagine could one day. But uh, you know, how much of our tools define us as a species? Mm-hmm. Uh, where where did the uh, the idea for the name come from? H plus. Um... Well, H plus is, H plus is is the uh, sort of uh, internationally recognized symbol for transhumanism, which is ah, uh, right. this cultural, intellectual uh, movement ideology um, that uh, supports um, the upgrading of the human body and the human uh, experience um, through technology, um, you know, uh, essentially human plus, right? Hum- humanity only better. So, so this, is, this is an actual organization? Well, not necessarily an organization. It's, it's. Uh, I mean, there are organizations that that use the uh, that use the symbol. It's more of a of an ideology. Uh, uh-huh. It's just the abbreviation for the word transhumanism, which is more of an ideology. Um, you know, for this upgrading of of the human body through advanced te- you know advanced uh, technology techniques from uh, genetic engineering to uh, implants like what we're talking about here, but it also sort of spreads out into other areas, um, you know, that, uh, that deal with the idea of the singularity and machine intelligence and the hive mind, collective consciousness, all of that good stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I watched the uh, first four, maybe,